Hello, everyone. So we're live um, here with uh, Tedro from Sociocracy for All. Uh, super excited to have him. I'm going to pass to Ted for a second to do a bit more of, a, of an introduction. But from my side, I'm, I'm Daniel. I'm one of the originators at Arendao, and we are an DAO Innovation Lab focusing on research on DAO operations and governance and DAO tooling incubation. And we are seeing a lot of potential to explore the parallels in between self-management methodologies and different experiments on progressive organization that's happened over the last few years and how we can learn from these experiments to also bring these lessons as we reinvent organizations in Web3 and specifically DAOs. So uh, thank you all for coming. And Ted, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. So a few words about me. I'm um, from Germany, but I live in the US. I've been for the last 10 years or so. And I got hooked on this sociocracy stuff about nine or so years ago. And that's what I do full time, every day, all day. Um, mostly teaching and consulting with organizations. And we are ourselves a sociocratic organization um, incorporated as a nonprofit. And with like 180 or so members um, and a bunch of people and staff. So uh, what's going to happen here is I will talk a little bit about sociocracy. And um, as Daniel was saying, the pieces interlock. So I know that I can only say one thing at once. That's the nature of the linear, you know, linear speaking. That's what it's like. But ultimately, I hope that within 30 minutes or 20 to 30 minutes, I can kind of give you give you um, a sense of all the different parts and why they belong together in the way they do. And then I will also talk a little bit about how it applies to DAOs and what I've heard and seen there. And uh, then time for Q&A, as Daniel was saying. So let me start by saying, right, here we are. what to me governance is, because I know outside of the DAO space where people don't really think so much about governance, um, people think that governance is something other people need. And you see my slide right now, right? About why governance, tell me if not. And the way I think about governance, it's, it connects the people with the thing that we want to do. So we have something that we want to do together and we have a bunch of people to do it with, that's great. But just because you have 50 people and a project you want to do doesn't mean it's going to happen, right? What we need is all this stuff in between. And that is what governance is, right? Like who decides what and how do we decide and how do we make it happen? So sociocracy as the word, just a few sentences on history, <clears throat> has been around since the 1980s. So about the time I was born. Um, it came from the Netherlands and it's a mix of all kinds of things and has been the basis of many of these role-based, consent-based, uh, circle-based uh, governance systems. And the word came about because of the two pieces here. Socio, like in sociology, is those who associate together, so the socios. And Chrissy, of course, is governance. So in a way, one could translated as those who associate together govern together or in a shortcut that's a little bit too short to be correct but it's nice to kind of get a sense it would be those who work together decide together different from democracy where people decide who are you know citizens but not involved heavily like they don't actually know what this big question is but they get to vote right so, and that is actually a tension that already comes up in that comparison between sociocracy and DAO governance, but we'll get there. So in sociocracy, those who work together are the ones who decide. Compared to hierarchy, right, a hierarchical system where decisions are made at the top and then carried out somewhere below, right, there we have like that unlinking of decision making and work, right? The people who decide are not the people who carry it out. The people who carry things out don't get to decide things. And in sociocracy, we put them both together. So those who, those who carry things out, we give them the power to make final decisions. And the way that works is we have a team that we call a circle. And that circle does work. 
and makes decisions, policy decisions about how things are generally done. Like they kind of set the frame together and they self-organize as a, as a unit. So for example, they will decide how often they meet, when they meet, how they organize their meetings, who facilitates and so on and so on. So they are basically a, a cell that is autonomous. There are two words of jargon that I need to bring here. One is aim and one is domain. Sometimes in some systems, like for example, in um, in systems like self-organizing systems, SOS and so on, that's called the mandate. But I really like to split it up into aim and domain. So aim is the, is kind of the purpose of the group. Like every circle should know what it's for, right? Like what is what is this group trying to accomplish? And the domain is a term to describe what the group is allowed to make decisions about. For example, let's say we have a group that is um, running some kind of garden together, then the aim of a part of that group would be, uh, let's say everything, like getting new members to join and the domain is membership that they can decide who can be a member and who can't. So those two go together. Now this is rather obvious if you only have one team because who else would be deciding but them, right? So um, if you have one team, that's very easy, but how does it work with several teams? And that is typically where people struggle the most. Running a team of seven, eight people as an autonomous unit, that's easy. But how do you do it with 30, 50, 200? How does it scale? That's basically the question. And Here's how we do it in sociocracy. And I'm going to stick to the gardening example just because it's very easy to understand. And you can then translate it in your head or we can do it together. And how would that look in, in other organizations? I use gardening because everybody understands what gardening is and what it involves. So let's say we have this team and then we have two other teams. And again, they each do work and they each make decisions in that domain that their work is in and they each self-organize. Like for example, if they want to meet weekly and they want to meet monthly, they get to do that because there's nobody that can tell them that. One other thing that I just said in a side comment, but I want to highlight it because it often gets forgotten. These people are doing work in the domain. So let's assign domains. Let's say just for the fun of the example here, these people in the community garden, they are the people who plant the plants, which means they order seeds and they get to decide how many varieties of tomatoes we're going to plant. Okay, they decide whether we're going to have potatoes or not. Okay, so they make these decisions. And they are also the people who oversee and mostly do all the planting um, and everything that has to do with that. Let's say in that community garden project, there's also this group and those are the people who would take care of the infrastructure. So for example, they set up fences and they um, make sure they are, the hoses are working and so on. The tool shed with all the tools. So they do that. So they might be fixing tools, they might be fixing fences, you know, that's what they do. And these people here, they might be the people who do everything that has to do with the people. For example, they um, show people around who are thinking about joining or they send a newsletter to everybody who's a member, that kind of stuff, like a membership people kind of committee. And again, the people who are on this group who are decision makers about membership are also the people who are all doing all those things that have to do with that so it's in sociocracy very unusual and very discouraged to have decision makers made out of groups who don't actually know what the work is like so you're qualified to be a decision maker by being on the team that does stuff now, this is all great. And really, if you think about it that way, everything in this organization is now already being done and decided somewhere. So really, we're almost done because everything has now a place where it can be decided. It's either in this bucket or in this bucket or in that bucket. It's either people-related, infrastructure, or plant-related. Let's say that's all there is. But now we need a place to make certain decisions that are more on a meta level. 
And that's where it gets interesting from my point of view. So what we do is we take two people from each of those circles and put them into what we call a general circle. And the general circle now makes hardly any decisions except for the decisions of who decides what. So for example, if it's unclear whether a certain decision lives here or there, you know, if they argue about that, for example, the decision of who gets to take harvest how many tomatoes, is that a membership question or is it a plant vegetable question? That would be something I could imagine would happen and then they would have to clarify it. First, just the, the, the circles together or maybe through the leaders or something, but then they would need to clarify that in how they write the aims and domains of the different groups so that we have clarity of what is decided when. So the general circle is needed so we can adjust and adapt our aims and domains of the teams so that we're not locked in and don't have anywhere else to go to resolve it. And of course, they also do information flow, right? Because each of the circles here will be reporting and that way everybody knows what's happening where. And they will also support, like for example, if these people are kind of worn out by whatever is happening here, they get to complain and whine a little here and get them support in the general circle. There is also typically what we call a mission circle that is like advisory board of people who look more long-term. So for example, where we, in, in the garden example, it would be like, what are we doing in terms of developing our membership over the last five, over the next five years or something like that. And you see again, so now I've overlaid it with these circles, right? So. Here you have the double link, which is what we call it. I'll talk more about that. So two people from this team here, right? And here, those two people here, and those two people here. But the general circle and the mission circle are also double linked. So that the people who do the long-term strategic thinking know what actually is happening on the ground and vice versa. So the double linking, as it's called, is always a strategy to make sure there's good information flow. But there's also another advantage of having this linking as a general approach. And that is that if this circle, again, argues with that circle about what's in their domain, and then we make a decision about it, the people who decide that are not some random other people. It's not some steering committee that just makes decisions kind of in a top-down way, but it's the people that are actually the people who are involved, plus their peers that make the decision together. So in that way, together with the decision-making method consent that I'll talk about later and linking, we can create a situation where no team can overpower another team because we always make up that team of parts of the other team and through that linking, there's never a situation where somebody else decides about something that affects me in my circle work. All right, then the whole thing becomes fractal. That's kind of the basic setup. And from then on, it's completely fractal. So if this group wants to decide to, or decides to have a subset of the decision makers, let's say this was infrastructure circle here. Let's say they have um, two or three people that take care of the wood, uh, the tool shed and the tools. And they can say, okay, let's not talk about the tool stuff here all the time. Let's just form a sub team. And they talk about that and they decide now. So in a way, that piece of the domain that is the tool shed, they now pass on to their sub-circle and now it's theirs, they decide. So if these people decide to paint the, the tool shed bright pink, they get to do that without asking them for permission because we've passed the domain into that group here. That's an important piece, the passing on of domains because otherwise power tends to kind of cluster in the middle, in the center. And then we recreate hierarchical systems where these people just decide everything. So we need to really have that courage to say, no, actually take it and it stays with you. You guys are now the decision makers. And when we're gonna give you feedback if we think you're making a really big mistake, but ultimately it is your decision. That's the way we decentralize um, authority in society. Let's see, not gonna talk about that. So let's zoom in on one of the circles real quick just to see what that looks like. So within a, within a circle, we will have several roles. So the, the two linking roles that I've already talked about, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But we also have some other roles like the facilitator, the person who's moderating the meetings. 
and we will have a secretary, the person who takes notes. And that is actually quite a big job because in this kind of way of working for us, it's important that everything is super transparent. So making sure good notes are taken and so that people can read from another circle or you know, from the general membership, they can see how decisions were made and what led to those decisions by reading the notes. So it has to be transparent. There's a little bit of a joke from going from everybody decides together to a sociocratic system. Um, the joke is, or the line is that if everybody decides everything together, everybody knows how little gets done. And if it's decided in a sociocratic way, hardly anybody knows how much is getting done. So, because it's all in different places, right? So that's why written notes in whatever way one does it are so important. Another piece is um, operational roles. So some people think it stops with circles, that's not true. You can also just cluster certain tasks and certain decisions and create a role and then give it to a person. And each person can hold different roles. Like in my organization, I hold, I don't know, 15 roles or so. So, you know, like I do a few hours of this here and a few hours of that there, and that's how we piece together the mix of the things that we do but it's clearly assigned to a circle and it clearly is held by a circle in terms of setting the frame. So it's clear what I'm doing. Let's see. So let's talk a little bit about linking and that's not so super relevant in practice. It's more that I want you to see it for to understand the spirit of sociocracy. Again, about how do we manage power and how do we decentralize power while still keeping everything connected. And it's this, so if now we have these two people here, right? The person in yellow and the person in like bluish stripes, I guess, or something. Those, that's the same person here, right? Or the same people here. And now if we want to make sure that this circle is well represented on the general circle, we need to make sure that the people here carry the information properly, right? In both directions. And for that, we have a delegate, this person, that is, so this person, also the same thing, right, is selected by this group, but also needs to be okayed by this group. So both of these groups have that person as a decision-making member, and therefore both of those groups need to be able to say, yes, we want to work with you. You can't just push somebody onto a group in sociocracy. And then here it goes the other way. This person is typically, can be done differently, but it's typically chosen by this group, like, hey, lead this department, please. But also the group that is being led by that person needs to okay that. You can't just give a group a leader and say, that's now your boss. That's not how things work in sociocracy. And ultimately, now that leads with the leader and delegate here, leads to a pattern a little bit like this. This is a graphic from a book, Many Voices, One Song. And you see how information can now flow and one of the side comments here is that if this person is giving a report about what's happening here or this person is giving a report what's happening here we always have that always have that second person in the room to give a little bit of a reality check so we're not creating a bottleneck where information just comes from one person who will have a stake at making things look good for example so it's more more transparent to have those two people I want to just show something. This is from a different slide set, as you can see. It's something that I did, um, especially for DAOs. I just want to reflect a little bit on decentralization and the different forms of decentralization. So in sociocracy, as I said, the people who work together decide together. So we have these teams with separate domains, and the doers are the deciders, right? That's a little simplified, but that's basically the system. And then, sorry, oops, oops. And then the system in in a system where we vote is that we have this ring of members or token holders that vote on stuff. And some of the doors, doers will of course also be. So this is more the pattern here of decentralization and the sociocratic pattern is more like this. I know it's a simplification, but just to give you a sense of decentralization means different things or it can mean different things. Decentralization has different nuances to it. And then from the same slide deck, just something I hardly talk about when I talk just about sociocracy because it tends to be unusual there. 
is how do we deal with the fact that we have people who are doers and deciders here, but then we have people who, for whatever reason, because they're different scenarios, might have a say or might want to give input. So what do we do basically with the general membership of the organization, whatever that means. And that, you know, from where I sit, that can mean all kinds of things. That can mean the parents of the school, that can mean the members of the food co-op, it can mean the members of the member nonprofit or the whatever. So there's so many different organizations that actually have this pattern of there's a bigger group that is not operationally involved, but needs to have a say. And that to me is the big design challenge of DAOs. Because in DAOs, we need to balance what the people get to decide who are operating the thing and what the people decide who we've invited saying that they can be decision makers on something. And there's all kinds of ways of doing that. One of the things that is more kind of the sociocratic style of doing it is to use that kind of mem or that stakeholder group, let me call it that, uh, for input, not necessarily for decision making. But again, it's a design question of where do you draw that line between de deciding and giving feedback and on what? So there's all the kind of the, the Lego bricks of how one can design that. There are many of them. And I think one has a lot of flexibility using a system like sociocracy in this way. Okay, just a few more things because structure is really, I think, the most important one, but I do need to say a few more things to give you a little bit of an appreciation for what sociocracy is in the different systems. So one is uh, that we, thanks to the, the clustering or the chopping up of domains and putting it into circles, we what we get from that is small groups, right? Because we're not deciding in a group of 30, we say, hey, only the people who deal with this and that, you are now a circle. So now we have group sizes more like this or even smaller, four, five, six people. And what that gives us is that we can create a situation where people can actually listen to each other in a more deep way. So one of the ways we do that, for example, is that we will often talk in rounds. What that means is if we're, for example, trying to solve a problem, um, we are now going to brainstorm by talking one by one by one by one so that everybody can hear everybody without getting interrupted or proven wrong right away and all that stuff so it creates more of a, of a culture of listening to each other and really taking in what the other one is saying instead of jumping um, on them right away then when it comes to decision making we all know this Somebody decides, there's majority vote, there's consensus. Where does sociocracy fit in? Decisions or cons um, policy decisions. So decisions that are kind of setting the general frame of things, like for example, creating a role or making a membership policy or things like that, they will be decided by consent. And consent is the most similar to consensus, but it's not quite the same, I would say, but people discuss that. So in consent, we don't ask, do you like the proposal? But we, we ask, do you think this proposal will work? Because people might like it. That means they consent, that's sweet. But they might also say, that's not necessarily the, what I want, but it is totally fine to achieve what we want to achieve. And in that case, both of those mean consent. So one can say yes to something that one didn't necessarily favor just because it also leads to a good result. We do object and say no. If there's a clash, this is supposed to symbolize a clash here. If there's a clash with the aim. And that goes back to remember when I said in the beginning, the definition of a circle, it has an aim and a domain. So we make decisions in our domain to support the aim, right? So if a proposal comes that is at odds with the aim, we would have to say no, right? Because if our aim is to run a community garden and somebody uh, makes a proposal that would imply that now we're going to spend three weeks in summer traveling, that's probably not going to work because our garden is going to dry out and die while we're gone. So in that case, not only are we allowed to say no to the proposal, I would even say we should say no because we came together to achieve a certain aim and we collectively are responsible 
um, to that aim. So in that way, objections are not a bad thing, quite the opposite, objections are helping us to stay on track. So it has a whole different way of looking at objections and looking at people who say no, that has a lot more appreciation for those people who help us see things that we might have missed otherwise. Just to be clear, all the decision makers in a domain, so all the circle members in a domain have to say, have to give consent to a decision. If one person objects, we're gonna talk more and hear what that person is seeing that we might be missing. So consent always means 100% of the circle members. If somebody from a different circle doesn't like what we're doing, that's a whole different thing. They can give feedback, but they can't stop us because we don't want people who haven't been part of the discussion and aren't part of the daily work and of doing those things, we don't want them to walk into our meeting, crash our party and say, oh, no, I, you shouldn't be doing this because that creates a very unhealthy dynamic in many organizations. So those who work together, decide together on that team level. Um, almost done, but um, the people who serve in roles, might it be an operational role or the role of the linking position or whatever else, these are um, selected by a certain process. It ends on consent. So for example, I am leader of the general circle in my organization. And the way I got into that position was because everybody in the general circle gave their consent to me being the leader of that group. And then I am that for a certain term. In this case, often it's like a year or six months. In this case, because it's a big role, it's a, it's a three year term. So in May next year, my term is up and then we'll have to decide together what's gonna happen next. So the, all, everything is always on a term so that we don't just have leaders who are leaders because at some point somebody made them that but hardly anybody remembers how that even happened. So it's always fresh and kind of kept up to date. Um, so surrogacy is used in all kinds of places, uh, communities, schools, nonprofits, businesses. Uh, what did I forget? Co-ops, for example, that's more of a relation. Uh, so all over the place. Just for a quick view, so you see a little of what that looks like when it's a little a little more fleshed out. This is the organizational diagram of, um, of my organization. So here we have the general circle and then main circles and you see it, the fractal system goes down and down and down and then it's always linked here, like two people from here will be here and so on and so on. We also have a mission circle for the long-term thinking as our advisory board, so to speak. Um, so Sarkozy for All gives courses, beginner courses, facilitation. We also teach communication alongside with it and we do everything kind of beginning to end. We do um, also certification and so on. So if you're interested in that, we can look at this page. There are books as well. Um, this is more for children or working with children. This is kind of the reference um, manual about how sociocracy works, kind of everything in one in one handbook. And then this is for how to start and like who decides in the beginning what the aim is, who the members are and so on. How does one go about that in a shared way? So this is basically the template on how to do that. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, that uh fairly in-depth and yet succinct presentation. Really appreciate it. If anyone has any any questions, just uh, raise your hand here to use it. And then in the meantime, maybe as you think of any questions that you might have, I actually, I, I mean, I know you mentioned that it's the, the topic of one of the books, but I was very curious to ask, uh, since I imagine you've seen a bunch of these transformations and maybe in DAOs is a little bit different, but at least in your experience, where where does one, uh, start. What's the what are some do's and don'ts that you have seen in that space? Yeah. So it depends. To me, one basic question about how do you start is how big are you, right? So if you are, and the question is not so much how many people you know are kind of discussing things. The question is how many people are operationally involved and consider themselves decision makers. If it's more than fifteen-ish or maybe twelve people then it's a little bit of an ordeal because then, well, let me talk about that second. If you're fewer people 
and you can still get into one room kind of, you know, virtually or not, but you can still be in one conversation and listen to each other, then that who decides, who decides works well because what it does is um, walk a group through deciding how they decide, deciding what the aim is, who their members are, and so on. If you're bigger, and that is the case, right, in many organizations, then it's a little tricky because, hold on one sec. Um, kid interruption, sorry. Uh, when it's a bigger group, then the biggest problem, and that I see in DAO space, in the DAO space too, the biggest problem is to decide who decides, who decides about the governance system. And if you don't have a way to decide that, you're incredibly stuck because then you can't decide how you decide, how you decide. And that question of legitimacy of who makes the decisions about our governance system is dishearteningly, dishearteningly paralyzing for groups. So the only piece of advice, and it's always messy and it's always really frustrating and annoying, but the only piece of advice that I have is that sometimes it's best just to inspire people and train people and get them excited. And then maybe the question of legitimacy doesn't even need to be answered because everybody's so excited about doing this thing. But still you need a group that kind of holds it and carries it, that, that is trusted by the rest. So it's a little bit of, a, that's I think one of the biggest struggles that we're dealing with as consultants. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. And interesting to see these, uh, this approach. If, if someone had a question, I think it disappeared. I cannot see you anymore. So please raise your hand again. But I, yeah, I see it very much from experience. I end up in that situation with a community in that the, the leadership kind of abandoned the community. And then it was just a bunch of us community members going like, well, we want to decide on a new structure, but how do we decide who decides because we cannot invite the whole community. Do we have the right to invite them? Do we have the legitimacy? It, exactly. Yeah, it, it, it's it, it's horrendous. And then it takes such tremendous amount of time just to get to the basics. And then the, the work hasn't even begun. Um, yes. And I guess, in, yeah. And I guess in DAOs, well, there is the voting mechanism in, in many cases, which can help this. Uh, but the question of legitimacy is sometimes kind of let's say delegated to if the, if the smart contract allows you or if the snapshot voting allows you, but those seem to be cop out and I can see many challenges in, in going in going in that direction. Um, Christina, if you'd like to, to go for it, please. Oh, okay, so I'm not a member of any DAO, so I just watch how people work on software projects. And in software projects, it's very oftentimes very much a duocracy. Like the people who say, I, I need this feature, how it's actually built is totally up to the people actually doing the work or how much testing is gonna be done to it. Like everything about the implementation is is frequently out of the control of, the, of everybody but the people that are working on it. So in that sense, there's already like a natural circle operationally deciding and then there's other circles already um, that might be making designs and then other circles that are just using the whatever the thing is so i'm wondering if if the step is well we already have these circles every like for whatever mechanism you want just pick a representative and then we'll talk about this so that way you know maybe maybe that would be like a very primitive way of starting um, that would get at least different types of people in the room because I guess from, from the developer point of view, the, the people asking for requests are often like insane. And from the user's point of view, the developers are these magical wizards. Um, at least this way they'll get they'll get to talk about what the priorities are. Maybe, maybe everything is fine or or maybe they do want some changes. But I don't know, not not being in a doubt. Yeah, and I think in those kind of contexts, Christina, the the work is more in making explicit what is already implicit so that one can talk about it, right? Because in all of these things, some, one thing that I pay attention to is not only how do we make it work, but also how do we make it work so that it becomes a self, 
regulating our self-healing mechanism. So do we always have a place where something can be decided if it can't be decided? So in your scenario, that sort of works, but I would still not know how it would work if it doesn't work, right? Like how do we how do we pull our head out of the sling if it doesn't work? That's why I find this whole concept of, for example, having a general circle that decides who decides, you know, and that then has a mission circle that decides what the overall aim is and so on. That's so smart because it's so resilient because you always have a way to resolve it because it's already delivered in the structure that you have a next higher something that you can resolve it with. So that's, um, I think there is, I guess the way I think about it for implementations and the question of how do you start, there's kind of different levels of depth, right? So what you're describing is great, but it's not at the level quite that it's a, that it's a resilient system. So that's, that's where I'm ultimately trying to go to have resilient systems. Renzo, please go for it. Hello, Daniel. Hello, uh, Ted. Thanks so much for your for the time, your presentation. Um, I just I have a question about how in intercircuity, and um, there is a way to uh, tackle the performance or about the desires, which means that if there is a circle that decide about something, and when I share my proposal, and I'm not happy about that, and so I could definitely do an objection, but in the first place where we uh, select these people, can we also select how they should perform uh, their decisions in order to have, let's say, more alignment if something doesn't go in a certain direction? So this is a contest I had experience in DAOs, we shared also with uh, some work sometimes with Daniel in the past, but for me, when I also learn about what how it's evolving, that's something that I, I feel is missing. And I wonder if in circuitry there is a solution for this. <laughs> yeah, I think I understand the question. Um, well, to me, there's one, one thing I want to go to first is where do proposals come from? And sometimes, especially in kind of a voting culture, proposals are you know made and then people vote, but they don't kind of organically come from a group. While if you have a circle that is small enough, ideally, and I know there's different there's different flavors about this, but I personally, this is just me, Ted speaking, not speaking for sociocracy, because I know not everybody who does sociocracy does it in that way. But I personally, I'm not a huge fan of proposals already, you know, in all the details written written up when I see it for the first time when I'm a circle member. I see that the proposals are most successful if they kind of if they were basically written together by the team and there are also processes and sociocracy by which one can do that so the situation shouldn't even occur is what i'm saying the other piece is that I, um in a way i want to answer it also with the distinction that sociocracy makes between policy decisions and operational decisions or in autocratic terms it would be governance versus tac uh, versus tactical stuff um the way I see the difference is policy decisions are general decisions, kind of rules about how this and that is done or like guidelines that steer how we do things in general. OK, so it's more kind of a, a in bulk kind of thing versus operational decisions. are What do I do about this one instance right now? Is there a rule that applies? Oh, no, there isn't. OK, so I guess I have to decide something just on this one instance. And for example, I mean, this is not a not an unusual thing. I mean. <laughs> I always say like, you know, sometimes people are like, oh my God, that's so complicated. I have to know which one it is. But every child knows if they ask for permission on something, you know, if my child asks for permission, can I stay out till midnight tonight? And I say, yes, they know that I didn't just give permission for each night, right, into the future. So we all understand the difference between a one-time decision, a one-time thing, and a general decision. So that is the difference between operations and policy. The reason I said that is because what I hear from you is, that you wish there was a place to not only make a decision about this one thing, but also kind of set a little bit of a frame of this is how we go about things. This is how we do this and that. These are the value sets guiding this and that. These are the priorities for the next six months. That's more policy decisions, which in sociocracy would be set by the circle. So you bring, you bring that question up and then you come to a proposal or you bring a ready-made proposal and make that decision so that you set the frame together and then people can go carry things out from there. 
Correct. Yeah, yeah. You understood exactly the context about having like a wider framework where a decision needs to be made. How do you uh, make sure there is more transparency how the decision is made? Because otherwise, you are just decided of yes or no. But what right, about exactly. Exactly. It lacks the it lacks the nuances and it lacks also the it lacks the element of co-creation. That's a sad piece for me because you're missing out on so much already. And often in, in these kind of situations where there's kind of this proposal culture, right? Where like a, a very individualistic culture where one person just makes a proposal and then you only can say yes or no, it has a very fragmented feel to to it. It's almost like you're building a house, but you have these huge blocks that you can build it out of, like, well, but you know, like now, where do I fit that in? It just seems too too uh, crude of a of a system, and it lacks the like, hey, let's build the foundation. Let's talk about the bathrooms kind of approach. So yes, that. And then one other thing about that though is that sometimes it is not fully clear, and that needs to be clarified. Those general frameworks about, let's say, what are our value sets, what are our priorities, kind of things, or how do we go about this and that? That might be a domain question then. Because the question might surface in a sub 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 circle, but it might actually belong more in in a sort of higher circle. So that sometimes needs a little bit of clarification where those overarching guidelines sit. Thank you. I just want to complete. Sorry for taking too much time. I just want to say that. Uh, so your suggestion is to have basically a circle for operational decision and one circle for policy decisions. No, thank you for asking. No, to me, they sit together. So let's say, let's do an example. Um, hold on, good example. What's a good example here? Um, no, they sit together in according to the domain. So in each in each domain, there are basically policy decisions and there are operational decisions because you set the frame and then you just follow your own frame by making operational decisions. Hold on, I also have a slide for you on this. Um, like this, right? How do I show this? This tab here. Um, so this is the overall organization. Okay, this is, for example, our community garden. Okay, this is infrastructure. This is whatever it was, people, and and so on. And then they set basically the frame by saying, okay, there's certain workflows, there's certain roles that we have, certain rules that we have, and so on. And they set that, and then the the operational decisions ideally just follow from that, but they're in the same realm. So let's look at membership. Let's say this is membership, okay, membership circle. They now have roles and they have certain workflows of how you become a member, for example. And then you have operational decisions that either just follow from the workflow, like the person filled out this and that form, therefore now they get access to this and that, okay? Or we have certain roles, or there are things that are in our domain of membership, but they don't have any rule yet that tells us how to make this operational decision. So then we just make it as a one-off and we just decide. So that's the, so that's, that is, it belongs together. And that to me is actually the cool thing about it, that you can have it, that you can have it made by the same group. Thank you, clear. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, Paolo, please go for it. Um, hey, um, Ted, so much, uh, thank you so much for the presentation, Ted. Um, I, I, I couldn't help but notice that there was a, a topic that was, uh, missing, and it relates very much to DAOs, which is uh, the topic of ownership, uh, who is the owner of the organization, right? And uh, in DAOs, uh, usually uh, it is um, presented as everybody can be an owner of the organization at some point in some kind of dimension. And I would just like you to ask you about how that is handled in sociocracy. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's such an interesting one. So yes, I mean, the way just as a why did I not talk about that? Because I am very aware that it's in my worldview, this is kind of a modular thing. I'm just talking about the governance ownership is its own module, right? How do you manage ownership and sociocracy is basically compatible with different modules. So for example, the reason why sociocracy is strong in co-ops is because of that shared ownership, right? And like worker co-ops, for example. Um, then it's so it's it's um it's compatible with shared ownership it's also compatible um 
with when basically nobody owns it. I know that's not where DAOs are, but more like a commons approach. Just as a fun fact, the reason we as Sociocracy for All are incorporated as a nonprofit is because that is the, that was at the time the closest to the ideal of an organization that can't be owned because it's its own entity. So that's why that was the choice. So yes, so that's it. Sociocracy itself doesn't make a statement about ownership because you can plug it in. But of course, one person owning a thing and then pretending that we make decisions about it um, together doesn't match, right? That's why it's not being picked up so much in the um, world of, um, yeah, single proprietary ownership, which makes perfect sense. Uh, Pablo, is that a continuation of the same point? Yeah, uh, I, I was just uh, to go a little bit deeper on it. Is that I was I was trying to figure out if um, um, the motivations of people that are deciding and people that are uh, belonging to the general circle, for example, if they are uh, owners of the organization more than the other ones are owners of the organization, if that would uh, influence their decisions in somehow, and if that would somehow corrupt the system, let's say. And so uh, I was trying to to understand if if there should be a guideline as to how ownership should be distributed for sociocracy to really, really work. Because I do think that in a nonprofit scenario, it works the best probably. And, but uh, uh, as soon as you start to put in the element of ownership, it can um, disturb the balance a little bit, it seems to me. Yeah, and I agree with you on that. And then, yeah, when really, I mean, there's all kinds of models like this, like fair shares models and so on. So there's all kinds of stuff. I just wanted to show one little thing really quick. Let's see if that's, yes, here. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea of how people are thinking about it in this space also, right? Yes, is, um, for example, in a, in a, oh, come on, in a co-op, there we go. You can have, so this would be the mission circle. I don't know if you're fast enough on kind of grasping this. So this is general circle, mission circle. And then there is um, a stakeholder circle basically, or another way of thinking about it is, I'd skipped that earlier. If you have this, remember that. So the mission circle can have basically stakeholder groups, like groups that represent stakeholder groups. So one could have, anyway, but that's maybe, also a little too deep and too far away from it. But the, the whole point being that there could be stakeholder groups in turn, like aligned with ownership levels or something like that, that are kind of, in addition to the worker, say, the worker voice, or it could be combined in some other way. So there's just too many options to really talk about meaningfully. Yeah, I, I've been seeing some parallels to that in in the way, for example, associations can have a board of governance and that board ends up institute, instituting a certain model of operational governance. In this case, could be sociocracy or something else. Uh, but then the decision of do we do sociocracy or do we do something else or how what are going to be the rules of the game and, uh, and how do we change them, that kind of like almost meta governance level can be handled through, through a different mechanism, which is a little bit, uh, also we're having a conversation with Brian from Holacracy the other day, and that, that was a little bit the direction that we were saying, or now because I, I've been involved a little bit or was involved with the Aragon Association, uh, now they're talking about the token holders becoming members of the, the Swiss Association, so then they can vote on uh, a governance model, and I don't know how that, that will end up being decided, but at least there are some some patterns in that direction that seem interesting. Can I just make one comment on that one? Because Please. that's actually something that is quite dear to me. Um, and it might be just me nerding out for one second, but um, here's the thing. In a sociocratic system, in my reading, like the way I understand, the way I practice it and the way also we practice it in, organiza in our organization, the constitution, what would be the constitution in holacracy, which we call simply a governance agreement, is yet just another piece of policy that lives in a domain. And in our case, the governance agreement is held in mission circle and mission circle by consent decides what the governance system is. So if we make change in what the definition of consent is, for example, we would have a place where that, where that is decided and it would be here. So we can actually do, and I know the idea of holacracy is that we're all equals under the constitution, 
And sociocracy to me, that's actually one step more radical. And that is that the constitution is also just a piece of policy that lives in a domain that can be changed somewhere. So that's just a really interesting kind of spin on that of those, like there is no such thing as a meta decision in sociocracy because it all plugs into a domain and can be decided. And of course that means like the implication of that is that in sociocracy for all, for example, all the 190 members have to trust that the mission circle is gonna give us the governance system or maintain the governance system that we're okay with because we've given away that power to those seven people. That's quite something actually. Yeah. And we can, for example, also change the mission. Like we changed the mission fairly recently. Uh, that's a big step too. Hmm. Power, powerful delegation, a lot of power delegated. Um, yes. I have a, a question here from Onchain. He says, mm -hmm. uh, a piece that seemed implied, a DAO is not a term project. Therefore, this the life cycle of a DAO is expected to be infinite in the planning and governing process. Perhaps a moot point, but when doing a DAO or a non-DAO comparison of these HR Gov processes, it occurs to me that there is a DAO never, never ending narrative with sociocracy is built upon. Comment? It's a DAO never ending, it's a DAO never ending narrative. I don't understand the question well enough. Yeah, the, on chain maybe you can, you can comment, but the, the way I understand it is never ending as uh, when we are talking the difference of a one-time decision versus policy, the same way we can talk about a project versus an ongoing team or uh, the way that that might operate. The DAO is generally not conceived. And, and here I'm paraphrasing on chain. If you want to come either type or unmute yourself, please go ahead. But the, the way I'm understanding it is this idea that the DAO is not perceived to end at some point. It's not like we're going to do this thing and once it's done, it finishes. So if there is perhaps a parallel that sociocracy, bec perhaps because he has this ability for the mission to be updated or the policies to be updated, to be continuously evolving and regenerating in some, like regenerating its own reason for being. Yes. And that is, I'm glad that is coming up. Yes. Because to me, it has, in order to be alive, right? Like in, I know some of you might be aware of reinventing organizations and that whole piece of kind of teal organizations, because, um, having your own purpose and being able to change and, uh, and adapt in your purpose, that is a sign of something being alive, right? So it has to be in a way so that it can adapt or maybe even decide to die. I mean, that might be in the bigger scheme of things, something that an organization might have to do because its mission is complete. So Super, super interesting. Um, Jose and, and Walter, apologies, we're, we're running uh, out of out of time. Um, if the Ted, uh, if you accept the invitation, but very very much up to you. Maybe we can continue the conversation on the Arendal Discord. I'll I'll share the the link for everyone if we want to continue there, or otherwise, hopefully in the future we can arrange another occasion. Uh, for as I was saying, for anyone interested in that the link is at the bottom of this one that i that i shared and once you ver verify there is a learning and discussion channel and we can continue continue these there um otherwise thanks a lot of everyone for participating and ted thank you so much for your time really appreciate sharing about sociocracy and this has been quite a, an inspiring conversation thank you have a great day great rest of the day everyone